The Little Mermaid This story is rated orange. The court ball was one of those splendid sights that we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were of thick but transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells stood in rows on each side, lighting up the whole salon. Innumerable fish, great and small, swam past the crystal walls. On some of them the scales glowed with a purple brilliance, and on others like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and in it danced the mermen and the mermaids to the music of their own sweet singing. But the little mermaid sang more sweetly than all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the sweetest voice either on earth or in the sea. But soon she thought again of the world above her. She could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. She crept away silently out of her father's palace, and sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water, and thought, He is certainly sailing above, he in whom my wishes center, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid. She can give me counsel and help. Then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the foaming whirlpools, behind which the sorceress lived. Neither flowers nor grass grew there. Nothing but bare, gray, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water seized everything that came within its reach and cast it into the fathomless deep. Beyond this was the witch's house, which stood in the center of a strange forest, where all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms with fingers like flexible worms, and all that could be reached they seized upon and held fast, so that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still and her heart beat with fear. She came very near turning back, but she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long, flowing hair round her head so that the polypi could not lay hold of it, and then darted forward as a fish shoots through the water, between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which were stretched out on either side of her. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where large, fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly, drab-colored bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house, built of the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, feeding a toad. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl all over her. "'I know what you want,' said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way, and it will bring you to sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail, and to have two supports instead, like human beings on earth, so that the young prince may fall in love with you, and you may have an immortal soul. And then the witch laughed so loud and so disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling. <laughs> you are just in time, said the witch, for after sunrise tomorrow I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a potion for you. You must swim to the land with it tomorrow before sunrise. Seat yourself there and drink it. Your tail will disappear and shrink up into what men call legs. You will feel great pain, as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement, and no dancer will ever tread so lightly. Every step you take, however, will be as if you are treading upon sharp knives. If you will bear all this, I will help you. Yes, I will, said the little princess in a trembling voice, as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But think again, said the witch, for once you have your shape and become like a human being, you can no more be a mermaid. You will never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace again. And if you do not win the love of the prince, 
then you will never have an immortal soul. The first morning after he marries another, your heart will break and you will become foam on the crest of the waves. I will do it, said the little mermaid, and she became as pale as death. But I must be paid also, said the witch, and it is not a trifle that I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea, and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it. But this voice you must give to me. I will have the best thing you possess as the price of my costly potion, which must be mixed with my own blood, so that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take away my voice, said the little mermaid, what is left for me? Your beautiful form, your graceful walk, and your expressive eyes. Surely with these you can enchain a man's heart. Well, have you lost your courage? It shall be, said the little mermaid. Then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magical potion. Every moment the witch threw a new ingredient into the vessel, and when it began to boil, the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magical draft was ready, it looked like the cleanest water. There it is for you, said the witch, and she took the mermaid's tongue so that she would never again speak or sing. If the polypi should seize you as you return through the woods, said the witch, throw them over a few drops of the potion and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this, for the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering potion, which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. She passed quickly through the water and the marsh and between the rushing whirlpools. She saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished, and that all within were asleep. But she did not venture to go into them, for now that she could not speak and was going to leave them forever, it felt as if her heart would break. She stole into the garden, took a flower from the flower bed of each of her sisters, kissed her hand towards the palace a thousand times, then rose up through the dark blue waters. The sun had not risen when she came up in sight of the prince's palace and approached the beautiful marble steps, but the moon shone clear and bright. Then the little mermaid drank the magic draught, and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went right through her delicate body. She fell into a swoon and lay like one dead.